Aloha, everyone, and welcome to Hawaii, the state of clean energy. I'm your host, Mitch Ewan, and uh, our underwriter is the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, which is a program of the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, of which I am uh, a, a part of. So today, I'm uh, very happy to welcome Toby Kincaid, who uh, is a thinker, and because he's a thinker, he's also an inventor, an author, and a, most recently, the publisher of uh, Green Hydrogen Today magazine, and most important, my friend for over 30 years. So aloha and welcome to the show, Toby. Aloha, Commander, good to be with you. So we wanna tap into the Brain Trust today and talk a little bit about water and its role in their, our energy system and it's pretty significant. And I think we're, because of your thinker status, we're taking a slightly different angle on water. Everybody knows what water is, uh, but they might not know how it's used in the energy system. And, uh, and I think we have a unique uh, take on it. So let's uh, roll it and let's start with the first slide. Let's discuss all the ways that water is connected to our energy system. So I'm going to let you lead off, uh, Toby. And if I think of anything, I'll jump in and ask a, qu a question. <laughs> aye, aye. Well, water is life. You can't have life without water. It's it's universal and obviously vital. And you know, through humanity, through our civilization, we've been very intimate with water. Water has been key to everything that we do. Of course, from agriculture, it waters our crops. But from an energy standpoint, uh, the history of water is and its relationship with human beings and our relationship with water is uh, incredible. So, in in this slide, I tried to kind of capture some of the key ways that we use water. Um, and it goes way back, you know, uh, the first evidence of water wheels, which is using moving water, that kinetic energy, uh, dates back to 10,000 BC. So we're, we're in the, uh, the Neolithic and uh, the ancient Chinese, there's some evidence in Persia, but the Chinese particularly, were using this uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. And uh, that's been an amazing uh, legacy that we've brought all the way to the modern, modern times. And another way that we use water is we boil water. Now we've been boiling water as a steam engine for about 300 years. Right. But what's interesting is uh, uh, James Watt, circa 1750, uh, if you look at number two there, uh, boiling water, he realized, hey, instead of heating up and cooling down the same cylinder, why not have a place that's always hot, that's the boiler, and another place that's always cold, that's the condenser. And so he realized, hey, you can circulate water, Water would go into the boiler, turn to steam, it expands, it does work, it pushes a piston or turns a turbine. And then what comes out of it is still steam. And you can't put steam back in a boiler because it won't do anything, it won't absorb anything. So what uh, James Watt figured out is, hey, we need a condenser here so we can take the water, that steam, and condense it back down into liquid water. And then that can be fed back into the boiler and we have this cycle. So how does and, a condenser work, Toby? Well, there's a couple of styles. There's a single use and double use. But the thing is, we've been doing this now for, well, as I say, nearly 300 years. Right. And uh, the, the use of water is they, they normally just pour it over the condenser, which the steam is going through. And then that heat is absorbed by that water. And then the steam will relax down back into water internally. So, but it's just the extraordinary amount of water. And I, I know that uh, we're going to be How talking. How much are we about. talking about? In the United States, we use something like 300 billion gallons of water a day. It's a lot of water. But when it comes What's to- What's that as a percentage? I'm sorry? I think, I think you said that was like 41% of the water. Well, we yes, use. now of all that water, how do we use it? Well, you would think agriculture would be kind of the largest demand. It takes 42% yeah. of all the water to run our, our livestock and, our, and watering our crops. But there's actually a single item that's even larger. 44% of all the water used in the United States does one thing. It cools thermal power plants. And that's kind of staggering, actually. That's a and, lot uh, of water. Oh, and I, I know you wanted to talk about what's going on in the world with water. So, uh, you know, uh, 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 yeah. India is having a drought. China is having a drought. Uh, there's floods going on, and of course Mississippi. And and I'll, I'll I'll turn it over to you to to keep going on that theme because it's it's a water is a disaster at the moment for for most humans, and uh, we better uh, 
fix it. Yeah. So I, I heard the other day that the rivers and streams in uh, Europe are getting so hot, um, they can't use them for cooling these thermal plants because the delta T, the, the difference in the temperature is not enough to make you know, those condensers condense efficiently. So it's a real problem, apart from the fact that some of the rivers are drying up and we've seen uh, in our Southwest here in the US and Arizona and, Las Be and uh, Nevada, uh, you know, some of our lakes and streams and rivers are actually drying up. So it's a heck of a deal, whereas other states have more water than they really want. At the moment, yeah, Mississippi particularly. But it's amazing, like you say, you know, the Colorado River, 40 million people depend on that river for water. And you have sure. Lake Powell in the upper basin, and you have Lake Mead in the lower basin. And Lake Mead is like something like 40 feet above Deadpool. And when you reach Deadpool, it's exactly what it sounds like. You can't move water, you can't make electricity, you can't irrigate. It, it becomes uh, a dead pool. And so uh, water is vital, of course, in our, in our modern life. So, it, it, you know, another way that we use water is uh, number three, which is kind of a 20th century idea. And this is where most of the utility storage happens is where they pump water from a lower reservoir up to a higher reservoir. And then let, when you need it, let it run down through a PEM stock or a pipe and, and turn a turbine. So we've used uh, moving water, that's kinetic energy. We've been boiling water, that's number two. Number three is kind of using potential energy as we pump that water up and then let it move down again. But now there's, a, there's an exciting fourth way to use water. There it is. There it is. And it, <laughs> this is my favorite subject in the world because of what it can bring to the world or what it could mean. And so in the fourth way that we use water, this is a, what I call water dissociation. And what we're going to do is in number four, if you, it's a little crowded, but you'll see that we use an electrolyzer and a fuel cell in the same power block, which is the same kind of uh, cement pad where you put all your power conditioning equipment. And in this way, we actually can create a hydrogen battery. Now, that's two words you never hear together in the same sentence talking about the same thing. But in this case, it, it becomes a, a water, a hydrogen battery, because we're taking water. We're now going to add energy through an electrolyzer and split the water into hydrogen and oxygen. You keep them separate so that you uh, store that energy. And then uh, when you want energy, they come back together in the fuel cell. They release that energy and they return back to water. So you see in this kind of uh, uh, scratching, this is uh, patent pending, U.S. and international. It's being developed now by a company in Portland called EV4, which owns EV Global. They bring an enormous expertise. The chief engineer, Hans Vandermeer, brilliant, uh, very capable. But uh, he's now developing this power block so that we can, we can put it to use. But it, it's, a, it's an amazing kind of 21st century uh, take that we can use water more or less like an energy spring. We stretch it out when we separate it into oxygen and hydrogen, and we snap it back together in a fuel cell. Uh, creating electricity and water again. So, so water is your starting point and water is your finishing point. Yes, the uh, perfect uh, cycle. So you're not, and, and the, uh, the point is, you're not throwing out water away. I mean, you may lose a little bit of that water, which you have to make up, but it's really, really, really tiny. It's not like, what did you say, 33 billion gallons? Well, it's, you know? uh, it, it, well, we use 300 billion a day in total for the country. But you can see 44% of that is 160 billion gallons a day uh, to cool down power plants. Yeah. And that water is wasted. It gets evaporated. It gets contaminated. It, it's, uh, it's an enormous amount of water worldwide. Now, we've been, doing, we've been using steam engines for 300 years. And it's, it's kind of time to maybe see if we could, we could find a better way. And when we look at the life cycle or the round trip between going from water into the electrolyzer and out again to the fuel cell producing electricity and then back to water, that has a higher round trip efficiency than a steam engine. And so that would be a better way. So for example, to your point, a nuclear power plant of one gigawatt drinks 12 million gallons of water an hour if it's a single wow. use. Sometimes they have some, some recycling uh, strategies, but often it's a single use. 12 million gallons an hour for a gigawatt. That's a lot of power, but that's a lot of water. Right. And so if we go to this 21st century uh, uh, water-based uh, electrochemical engine, 
then we don't have a thermal engine and we don't need to use all that water to cool down a, the condenser on steam engines, which is, you know, centuries old. We, it may have been viable in 1850, 1870, 1890, uh, maybe even a good idea in the 1920s, perhaps. But now in our modern world, no, we, we, we have to be a little more sensible about that. Uh, let's talk about weight and range. So we're not talking about the weight we all put on during COVID. Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> we're talking yeah, exactly. about the weight. Why don't you explain the slide there? Sure. You know, last time we spoke, we talked about the round trip efficiency or system efficiency in using renewable to power battery electric vehicles versus using renewable to make clean hydrogen and use that as the battery and then either dispense it directly when you want to have a fuel cell vehicle or use it to run a, a a fuel cell to run the uh, DC fast charge. So when we look at this next slide, um, what we're kind of looking at is, is uh, kind of a graph that, that kind of tells the tale, I think. And that is when you want to increase range on a battery electric car, the only thing you could really do is, well, add batteries. And batteries what? are heavy. You know, lithium ions very light, but they 85 kilowatt hour battery is about a thousand pounds. So what we see here in this graph is if you want to extend range, the battery EV has no choice but to add more battery, which means more weight. And by the way, when you charge a battery, they say, please go from 20% at the discharge all the way up to 80%. So that gives you about 60% of the battery to use. And the other 40% is really there to support the 60% you are using. So well, if you have to keep adding batteries, this has a profound effect on system efficiency, but also you just have very heavy vehicles, it's kind of dead weight. And that's important because in a, in a vehicle, 60% of the work done is to move the air out of the way. So it's, it, the aerodynamics are obviously important, but the second biggest factor is rolling resistance. And that's a function of weight. You know, a dump truck doesn't roll very far unpowered. A bicycle, right. will, you'll be able to roll quite a bit of ways. So it's that rolling resistance. And that's why when you compare it with a fuel cell, you know, a big truck, we're adding seven kilograms, maybe the tank itself. You can't even measure the difference in weight. But when you extend your range, all you do is you just need a little bit of lightweight fuel and, and you're ready to go. And I just wanted to mention that because it, it, it makes a big difference. So if you see on the left under battery, I drew a little car on a little light truck and Maybe you could do some other vehicles in a demonstrative way, but in a practical sense, when we go to a fuel cell electric vehicle, uh, you can run any vehicle, anything, cars, trucks, buses, vans, trains, and planes, trains, and automobiles. We can run any kind of machine with, you, with the same station. That's what I really admire in what you're doing on the big island, using solar energy to make green electrons. You then run the electrolyzer making green molecules and you have a public transit from sunlight and water. I think the whole right. world could learn something from that. So, so in this slide, I'm just trying to, to remind everyone on the left-hand column, the left side, that's the 20th century. We have toxins spewing out everything that we do. We have it when we dig, when we frack, when we strip mine, with everything that we're doing you know, with, the, with the oil wells and the pipelines and railroads and all of the, the uh, um, processes that are constantly emitting all of these toxins. So in the middle of the sketch, you see the earth and there's humanity saying hello. And to the right of him is, is or her is the sun, a so, a solar energy, wind, wind energy, and water. And just with those elements, just with those things, we can bring it into this uh, hydrogen battery, this universal standardized power block, which fits in between renewable energy and humans. Because right. renewable energy is kind of intermittent, changes all the time, but human beings, we're, we're on demand. If we want something, we turn the, the switch on, light goes on, we push the accelerator, right. the car goes forward. We're a very much on demand kind of species, kind of civilization. So there has to be something in between that variability and our constant and, and on demand needs. And that is storage. And the hydrogen battery really seems to be the best storage around because it has a uh, hundred times the specific energy density, that's by weight, a hundred times over lithium ion. Now lithium ion has a pretty good power density. You can short them, the battery across the motor and you get great traction. It's really fun, great. But uh, 
the energy density in lithium ion is just not enough to run these large machines or long ranges that we need. So what's kind of neat about this universal hydrogen battery is now you can provide both. So if you, it used to be kind of a little bit of a war against the, the, the two sides because they're arguing, whereas the batteries don't have enough materials to do it. So I think the fuel cell argument has a point. But uh, now with this charging center, you can have both. So it's really kind of a, a universal uh, platform. So uh, I just saw a news report today that the governor of uh, California is telling people not to charge their battery electric vehicles. So uh, because uh, they're expecting a heat wave and that the, uh, the uh, draw of electricity to keep uh, air conditioners going is gonna overload the uh, grid and they can't afford to have the battery electric vehicles plugged in. Of course, we don't have that problem with your universal uh, station because we can still charge battery electric uh, vehicles. We're not knocking, I'm not knocking battery electric vehicles by the That's way, right. because fuel cell electric uh, cars have batteries in them and they have their place. And uh, in some uh, applications, a uh, battery uh, electric vehicle might make a lot of sense. But what I like about your universal charging station is you can either fuel vehicles, uh, fuel cell electric vehicles, or you can charge them using the same system. So it's, uh, and it's all has to do, thanks to water, that you can drag the uh, hydrogen out of the water, use it for a useful purpose, and then it reverts back to water again. The perfect Wonderful. cycle. So the future of energy. So again, this kind of just puts it in, a, in, in to me, a very straightforward manner. We're starting with, it's just one, two, three. We're gonna start with solar, wind, and water. That's gonna, so that E with the little negative sign, that's electricity and water. That goes into this power block. The water is, separated into hydrogen and oxygen. The oxygen is typically vented. You could keep it if you're a fish farmer or a welder or a hospital, that'd be fine. But just like in your system, the hydrogen comes out of the electrolyzer, it usually comes out a little bit wet. So it goes through a desiccant to dry it. Then it goes through a filter to remove everything else. And once you have pure hydrogen, it's very safe to work with, then you compress it and put it in the tank. Now, what's coming out of this hydrogen battery is electricity through the fuel cell if you want it on demand, or and or hydrogen fuel if that's what you wish for your construction equipment or mining equipment or agricultural equipment. And so what we see with just these two outputs, electricity and hydrogen fuel, you can power everything we do in our modern world. Right. And in that graph at the very top, at the on the right hand side, you'll see kind of residential, commercial, industrial loads. So we can do a built environment, the HVAC, heating, ventilating, air conditioning. We can certainly power those. We can power every kind of vehicle type from light duty to medium duty to heavy duty. The garbage trucks that you talk about in bringing your municipality up to speed with converting to fuel cells, that's exactly in line. That's just what we should do. And then at the bottom of that chart, you'll see kind of the big kind of gorillas in the room we don't really talk about much. And that is the there's the pillars of civilization, which are steel, cement, ammonia. You know, we have almost 8 billion people. Unfortunately, I, I'm not a big fan of, of, of uh, fertilizer because I'd like to see organic, but it doesn't matter what I'm a fan of. We're talking about the, the survival of, of millions of people here. So we make a lot of fertilizer. We need fertilizer. Um, I wish that we would be a little more sophisticated in the micronutrients that are required by plants. So we kind of scorch it with this kind of fertilizer, but nevertheless, we're talking about a lot of people's lives. So those are the big, heavy, uh, heavy lifting things that we do as a civilization and that we have done for three centuries uh, burning right. carbon. We don't need any. And once again, it's, a, it's yeah. water that allows us to do this. Amazing. So that's, yeah, that's kind of the well, angle we're following on this show. It, 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 it's brilliant. Water is, is um, well, it's, it's us, <laughs> it's life. It's us. Yeah. And right now we're not managing water very well. You know, this uh, billions of gallons a day, 100 billion gallons, 140 billion gallons a day, just to, to cool off steam engines. Right. So for those out there who are advocating for nuclear energy, a lot of people are saying, bring nuclear back. I'd say, wait, 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 you know, it's the most expensive. That's kind of a problem. There's a lot of cement, that's a lot of CO2, that's a problem. But at the end of the day, folks, you've got to get past the steam engine. The, the, the past is the steam engine, not the future. So all that water that it drinks is why we need to move on to better technology, 
And what's funny about this is that the, the electrolyzers and fuel cells have been known for about 200 years. But, and there have been moments when history could have embraced this, but uh, the, there's so much money to be made with a hole in the ground of uh, giving you something that you sell to everybody that it's been pushed away and pushed away and pushed away. And so now finally, I think the world is really, everything has kind of come to the right place. We have pioneers like you who have demonstrated how you can take sunlight and water and make public transit. That's pretty incredible. Right. And, and yeah. that's what we need to be applying because that's what's going to allow our children's children to survive. Because right now the world is clearly becoming unlivable. I mean, right. it, the, the heat waves are extraordinary. We, we, last year in Portland, we had the, the driest April ever recorded. And then this April was the wettest ever recorded. Back to back. Yeah, go Two years. Yeah. That's crazy. That's the mayor of crazy town. Let's talk oh. about uh, toxicity and non-toxicity. So oh, let's, uh, okay. Once again, the theme, uh, the theme is, uh, you know, uh, well, I'll let you talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, the theme is water and how we're going to, to uh, go. keep using fresh water. And so what you have here on the left is our world. It's the oil world that, that that's supposed to be a mountain under the oil rig that's been chopped off and there's a there's a uh, dump truck taking the coal down and it gets put on a train and then they take it to a remote faraway place ideally and then they burn it and you burn it to heat that water up and then as we described our old friend the boiler and the condenser and then you'll see in that drawing i put a there's a river of water <laughs> that you need to cool down that condenser basically right. and we do all of that so that we can put electricity in a wire and bring it to your home on the right hand side and yeah, we throw the water away well i guess some of it ends up if it does end up back actually in a river it can be used for agriculture further downstream it, but, it, it uh, can but 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 there's there's problems you know when you when you put it back into a into a river or a stream uh it's hot so it affects the the critters and the fish that are right, really yeah, sensitive exactly, to temperature exactly. yeah and so there's really a kind of a downside all the way around and let's just leave the water uh being water instead of wasting it and most of it gets evaporated and it's just thousands and thousands and thousands of gallons an hour uh, right. just yeah. being thrown away so on this picture you see in the in the upper part that's the way of the world this is what we do and the idea of burning fuel and spewing toxins and then using all this water to cool I mean, oh boy this this is not uh well it's not sensible we can't go on doing this and and on the bottom we have a contrast because now you start with solar, wind, and water, like we've been talking about. You put it in this universal power block, and uh, then you have electricity for the house or, or hydrogen fuel that you could use for a variety of purposes. So when you compare the two, the idea is just, you know, wow. I, I'm just trying to help, uh, get everyone to, I hope, uh, see that this is just no future in it, and, and we should really get on this with the utmost dispatch. Well, I think people are waking up. I mean, uh, somebody when I first came to HMEI a long time ago now said, uh, what's it going to take to get hydrogen? And I said, well, maybe $10 a gallon gasoline, because uh, there has to be a pain point. Uh, otherwise, you know, people are really comfortable. They get used to it and they accept it. But uh, we're seeing such uh, uh, radical movements now in our energy system that, you know, a lot of people say, well, we're waking up you know to what the issue is and of course the the war in uh ukraine uh and the cutting off uh of uh russian uh gas i mean that's woken people up about the security of supply we talk about that in hawaii all the time about the fact what happens when the oil tankers don't show up you know and uh, now they're showing up with much more expensive oil so what are we doing we're going to bump up our and we're cutting out coal so our electrical prices, our costs are going to go up by at least 7%. So far, advertised is 7%, but maybe more. Um, so, yeah, we, now we're starting to feel the pain. And hopefully that will motivate people to do something about it. And we have a solution. You know, It's not like we're helpless and the sky is falling. We just have to do it. And uh, exactly. so we, we, we have that technology here in Hawaii thanks to the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute and the people that supported it. And thanks to uh, leadership, like on the Big Island in particular, our mayor over there, who is uh, really promoting uh, public transportation uh, and converting that over to a hydrogen system. In fact, uh, they just won a, an award of uh, $23 million 
from the Federal Transit Administration to purchase uh, six fuel cell electric buses, full-size buses, 40, 40 footers, carry 40 passenger buses. And uh, so there you go, we're on the way, we're on the roll. Uh, Riley Sato is looking at the landfill as potential energy uh, to make hydrogen to, so we can use our a waste to hydrogen plant. So we have those solutions and we just have to like do it and give it the right priority in kinds of things we pay money for. So, uh, so I've had my little rant. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit more about your universal uh, station, charging station, but not too much because we've heard a lot about it already. This last slide is just a, a kind of a representation of, of what we're doing in Oregon, but what, what could be done all over the, the world. And that is the, the, uh, the fleet managers. These are the unsung heroes of the world, right. fleet managers. They manage fleets. And here you see Oregon and there's the PDX fleets. So I, I just put a couple of types. Again, you have all these types of vehicles. And so the fleet managers are kind of going crazy, pulling their hair out, saying, how do we, everyone tells us we need to transition, but how are we gonna do it? How are we gonna transition these fossil fuel vehicles to a clean vehicle when uh, the infrastructure, we don't know which one we wanna use. And that's why this, this universal charging station is so vital because it, it works for everyone. It'll work anywhere, uh, deserts, mountains, it doesn't matter what country you're in. If you have sunlight and water, or sunlight, wind, and water, or the landfills. You know, I love the, the the concept of waste streams into revenue streams. That's brilliant. Yeah, uh, I think uh, Riley calls it turning trash into gold. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, this that's is great. the right attitude. This is the this is what we need to do. And so, so you, know, you bring it, up a really important point, though, Toby, and and that's mm -hmm. uh, when you say uh, fleets, because that's the quickest way to transition is because you have one guy who might buy 20, 30, 40, maybe 150 vehicles all at once. And so you use your, uh, you use your hydrogen station. That, that way you can build up the demand for hydrogen faster. You don't have to rely on the government to uh, subsidize it because then it becomes uh, profitable and then the business uh, community will take over. So that's, that's absolutely the way to go, in my opinion. And I think, I think we're gonna see that on the big island soon. So uh, oh, I think yes. we're almost out of time now, um, and oh. we're gonna have to wrap it up. So I want to give you a little plug on the back end. So uh, that's uh, Toby's uh, uh, magazine. Tell us about your magazine quickly, Toby, because we're almost out of time. Sure. Uh, well, I developed a green hydrogen app, and as an app, I list all of the companies that under fuel cells and electrolyzers. So it's like an industry directory, and we have other features like a green hydrogen jobs and green hydrogen stocks. So it's really a tool for people to connect in the industry, but it's in the format of a magazine. It's available on, on the Apple App Store and Google Play. Just search Green Hydrogen, you'll find me. That's our logo. And uh, I hope you'll download it. It's, it, it's free to download. There, you'll get a preview of the different issues. If you want to download the full 130 page issue, it's like $3.99. Uh, support the channel, thank you for doing so. And I hope you enjoyed it. it it's uh, it's a, a lot of effort and a great joy because we get to talk about people like you and what you're doing to move us from where we are to where we really need to be. Right. So bravo. Well, I buy it every, uh, every three months. So it's a great magazine. So thanks for uh, taking that initiative, Toby. And I think that's, uh, we're gonna have to leave it there. So you've been watching Hawaii, the state of clean energy, and we've been talking about water and our energy system in a kind of a different way. I still managed to sneak the hydrogen thing in a, uh, quite, a while, uh, quite, quite well, I thought. And we've been uh, talking with Toby Kincaid, who is a thinker, author, inventor, and publisher of uh, Green Hydrogen Today. So, Toby, thank you so much uh, for coming on the show and sharing your thoughts with us today. Thank you. Hello. So uh, we'll be back in two weeks with another show at uh, Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.